Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will endeavour to speak up, it's not usually a problem for me, but if anybody can't hear as I'm bellowing away, uh, please say so and I will endeavour to shout even louder. Um, thanks for the opportunity to come and talk to you today about contracts. Usually when I give talks it's around the subject of the public contract regulations, um, but in the climate where a lot of HEIs are questioning whether they are caught by the regulations at all, the common legal denominator we're all going to have in common in the future is contract law, just like it's always been. And um, contract law is one of those areas of law um, where 95% of the time you don't actually need it. But the 5% of the time when you do need it, boy, do you need it. So it's worthwhile making sure that it's, it's correct and right. And my feedback on the sector, and we act for a lot of the universities and I advise them personally on procurement and contractual matters um, is that quite often um, contracting arrangements are put in place by universities that at the time are correct, are legally compliant and then what tends to happen is somebody sees a clause that they quite like the look of and they cut and paste it into a set of terms and conditions. They're not updated regularly by lawyers and so they become very disjointed and the main thing that they suffer from is confusion, conflicting terms, lack of clear definition and this is because they've evolved over time rather than have a rolling program of complete refreshment. So I'll talk a little bit about what the requirements are for a contract and break that down for you. Um, what I'm not going to talk about is contracting from the perspective of construction. Um, that's a very specialist game and not one that I've got time to cover today. Um, I have got slides. If you want copies of the slides, just ping me an email on the email address that's on there and I will email them out because at the minute we don't know whether they'll be available sent out centrally from the, um, from the SUPC. So I'll go through these now, endeavouring to talk for about half an hour or so, but that depends on the number of queries and questions that you lot have got as we go through. Uh, so please shout out if anything occurs to you that want to clarify or want me to, um, to amplify on. So we'll start off with the basic stuff. And this is going to get broken down into, into further <coughs> sections at the, at the moment, um, in, in a moment. That we got all of these need to be there for a contract to be legally enforceable. There needs to be an offer, which is accepted. There needs to be a thing called consideration, an intention to create legal relations, and certainty. And that's an issue, the certainty issue, I'll come back to that again later, is the issue around these evolving terms and conditions that can have contradictory provisions within them. And a lot of contracts that I see fail in enforceability because they're insufficiently certain in relation to their terms. They contain inconsistencies. So, let's start off with uh, an offer. Um, an offer, in a, the legal sense, has got to be certain. So it says, here is my unequivocal offer to you, which you can accept or decline. Offers are not invitations to negotiate. And so quite often when we're in a tendering situation, we've got to ask ourselves, at what point does anybody have a contract that's capable of being accepted unequivocally? And that will usually be an offer, you, you won't make an offer when you send a tender out. You will say, here are our terms and conditions which we propose to use. And they will write back to you saying, well, that's all very well, but we quite like to make a few amendments to it. Th at that point, they are making a counter offer to you, which you can then accept. Their offer and acceptance has not occurred yet by that happening. Um, the issue with incorporation of the terms is that when you are making an offer and someone accepts it, that is the moment in which the, what the lawyers would say that the terms crystallise. So that's the moment at which 
a contract is formed if everything else is in place. And so making people aware of the terms at the offer stage is clearly you know, vitally important. The terms need to be uh, specific, they need to be complete, they need to be capable of acceptance and made with the intention to be bound. If they're not got any of that, the law will start implying things in. And if the law starts implying things in, then the control has left both parties. And sometimes buyers and sellers, if they rely on implied terms, um, won't have all the protections that they need, and we'll come on to that uh, shortly. You can, of course, enter into a contract without even realising it by um, deed, by action, by a course of dealing, and sometimes as well, if you have a series of contracts that are identical in terms of their performance and their subject matter and their payment terms, if you forget to then issue a purchase order for one of those series of contracts, but they're a lot like all the others, the courts will say, well, the, co the course of dealings will be that whoever it was would be accepting those terms and conditions. So sometimes you can get away with it in terms of not having express terms in relation to, but that's not obviously what we would recommend and we recommend one of the one of the do's is try to put all your terms and conditions in one place um, quite often in um, throughout throughout the, the public and quasi public sector they can be in different places different appendices they can be in different parts of documents they can refer to other documents that aren't even anywhere near the, um, the contract that's being uh, finalised. Um, so try to have them all in one document, all in one place, because it minimises confusion and m maximises certainty. Try to all have them contained in the same document. If you do have appendices and schedules, that's entirely normal. Make sure you have an order of precedence clause so that you will have uh, an express clause in the contract that says in the event of um, inconsistency, the, docu the following documentation will be read in the order of precedence and you will list them going out. Um, sometimes within that I've seen people include things like invitation to tender documents and tender responses so that you contractually bind the bidders to be uh, providing what it is they say they're going to do in their tender response. And, but if you're going to do that, make sure that's quite at the bottom of your list of order of precedence because you want your main terms to be the ones you've actually negotiated and, and everybody's signed up to. Um, acceptance needs to be um, unequivocal, so you can't say, yes, I accept your contract terms, but with the following amendments. That's not an acceptance, that's a counter-offer. Um, so if you've included terms and conditions within your tender and you get some variant back, then that is up to you to accept or decline. You've not, they have not got a contract with you at that point. They've just said, I'm prepared, to, I'm making you an offer that says, I'll off our contract with you on the terms and conditions that I'm sending back to you and it's up to you whether you accept or not. Only a completely unequivocal acceptance will do to bind. That said, of course you can do um, acts that they will then bind you. So if you then start to say things like, well we will start performing the contract but we will then agree the terms and conditions later that's a very dangerous game to play because as soon as you are deemed to have accepted the terms and conditions whatever's in play at the time will um, will be binding and that's how we end up in I'm sure we've all heard the term the battle of the forms situation where you will send out standard purchase order terms and conditions they will send you an order at an order that says thank you for your purchase terms which we are ignoring here are our sales terms which we will abide by and I've now got clients because of that who serve on the other side on the on the on the seller side um, when if they get one of those back some uh, another document that stresses that it's on our terms. Now the critical thing then is when have you started to be bound to observe the contract. From your point of view that's usually quite, um, that's usually after the, the seller has started to observe the terms of the contract because they will start making deliveries or they will start manufacturing or they will, they will do whatever it is that they are doing. So time is on your side in terms of, um, in terms of the battle of the forms but as soon as you start accepting deliveries or accepting 
people coming in to perform services, unless there is express terms and conditions, you can find yourself with no contract terms at all, or on the supplier's terms and conditions, um, or on implied terms and conditions, as I said, which are seldom ideal. These days you can enter into a contract via email correspondence as well as um, uh, as well as conduct. So uh, uh, another do I would suggest is if you are negotiating contract terms and you're discussing contract terms, mark your emails subject to contract um, so that everybody knows that you are not giving them an unequivocal offer that they can accept. Um, so that we can make sure that you don't end up on, you know, on their terms um, and conditions. Um, so, as I say, beware acceptance by behaviour, ensure clarity throughout. If you don't mean to be bound by a set of a course of dealings, tell them. Say something like, we will accept a delivery on this occasion, but we do not accept your terms and conditions. Be very explicit about it. Um, and in all likelihood, they will make, want to make a delivery um, before you need to accept it. So you're probably going to win the battle of the forms nine times out of ten. Consideration. In most purchasing situations, consideration is very obvious. Consideration is money or money's worth passing between two parties in return for a goods or a, goods or a service. Um, it doesn't need to be the true value of the contract, which is quite often why we see the one pound amounts put in a lot of contracts to avoid the issue of consideration. But the biggest issue with it is past consideration. So what you will end up with is a situation where they're saying, because we've been observing this contract for ages, um, we will vary it in the following X, Y, Z ways. Well, just because they've been observing it up till that point and there's been a contractual value and consideration up to that point does not mean that that will be legally binding going forward. So on contract variations, I quite often see this going horribly wrong, where everybody just says we will um, novate or assign a contract from party A to party B, and everybody will just continue to observe the terms and the conditions and blah de blah de blah Beware of those sorts of agreements that don't either, one, express themselves as a deed, because deeds do not require consideration, or B, include within it some sort of nominal amount that transfers between the parties. Any agreement that you, a confidentiality agreements can be the same, where nobody is actually giving anybody any valuable consideration. So try to put within those type of agreements um, values, monetary values, to exchange hands or express them as a deed. Once upon a time, deeds had to be um, under seal and all sorts of things. And a lot of universities' standing ordinances haven't kept up with the changes. A deed can now be made what's called underhand, which is basically, it's a contract that calls itself a deed. It doesn't need to have the seal on it or anything like that. But a lot of institutions haven't made that amendment to their constitution, which means that it won't actually be a deed until your seal's gone on it. So that's a self-imposed restriction on your ability to be better at contracting. So if you have that, then um, those sort of restrictions in your um, financial regulations or ordinances, look again at those um, and if you have the opportunity to, I'd encourage you to remove the onerous restrictions on deeds, because usually what it says about deeds is we will apply the common seal of the institution and it will have to have some sort of board ratification for it or some scheme of delegated authority down to the, some executive officer within the institution. Those are from the days where deeds were for the disposal of land and for massive contracts. These days, a lot more deeds are being used in everyday contracting. And you don't want to have to be going cap in hand and waiting for board meetings in order to get a small deed agreed. So have a look at that. Um, intention to create legal relations is always assumed in commercial agreements. It's no point saying, oh, I didn't mean that to be binding later. The sort of institutions that you are, you do not have consumer level protection. So you will be deemed to be big enough and bad enough to be looking after yourselves in terms of contracting. So if you make an offer, you will not be allowed to say, oh, I've changed my mind. 
that's that will not work at an institutional level like uh, like the ones represented here today. <coughs> certainty, right? Well, I mentioned certainty before in terms of the confusion of the um, of the, of the steps. Uh, I mentioned a couple of cases. One on this filling of the gaps business, uh, MRI trading um, case from 2013 was about um, the value on some contracts not being filled in. Now, usually before this case, what would happen was, the, 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 what the case was about was the value of some sold commodities. And the um, agreement was, well, I'll deliver you X tons of whatever it was, and we'll work out the, the pricing in the usual way. Now, before this, the law on this would be saying things like, we'll work out the pricing in the usual way would not be certain enough. Um, you'd have to set out within the contract what the terms were in relation to delivery, pricing, um, title exchange, those sorts of things. Um, but this went as far as the Court of Appeal, and they backed up the, the High Court in that what they said was, because there'd been this history of the way that we were going to work out these finer details later, it was going to the court was going to intervene to impose the usual way that they did things on both of the parties. So the courts will, on sort of rare occasions like this, um, work out what you actually meant the contract to say. The general message is they're very reluctant to do so. Just having a bad deal, they don't care about the courts. If you make a bad bargain, they're not interested in helping you out. And the same applies to the seller, of course. Um, but in rare occasions where you have a regular course of dealings and you, everybody knew how they would work out the pricing and the delivery and the transfer of the title and all those happy things, the courts will on occasion intervene and say, well, you've done that 999 times. You must have meant to do it for the thousands. And that's how we're going to actually work it out. Okay. Another issue that we have quite often in contract drafting is endeavours. How hard does someone have to try to do something? Um, and we usually see um, reasonable endeavours or best endeavours. And the law swings like a pendulum on this about whether there is really a difference between best endeavours and reasonable endeavours or whether there isn't much of a difference between the two. And the law at the minute is saying that there is quite a big difference between reasonable en endeavours and best endeavours. Jet 2 case was about access to um, gates and, uh, at Blackpool Airport <coughs> and the contract said that Blackpool Airport Limited will use its best endeavours to make sure that Jet 2 can fly in X number of jets a day and they will make gates available and those sorts of things. Um, <coughs> and Blackpool Airport failed to do that. And they said, well, we've given you every available slot that we can to fly your jets in. Um, and unless we start paying our people a load of money to keep everything open a lot longer during the day, then we can't give you the num currently the number of um, slots that you want and that we, are, we acknowledge we contractually obliged to give. But the, the contract said we will use our best endeavours to do that. And the law at the time, coming up to this 2012 case, was that best endeavours stopped at being commercially damaging. It was everything up to it starting to cost them money, whoever said they were going to use their best endeavours. And this case, the Jet 2 case, said, no, if you say best endeavours, it has to be best endeavours, even if it costs you money to do it, even if it's commercially unviable for you to do it. Your best endeavour is still to do it. And so these days, a reasonable endeavours clause will mean everything up to, but stops at, it commercially damaging and costs you money. A best endeavours clause will go further than that and say that even if it costs you money and you have to go further than you otherwise have got, would have gone, you still have to do it. Now, quite often we see contracts where that isn't clearly understood. Um, and so it's a useful trick for you because usually best endeavours will be something that you want people to do um, and best endeavours will be something a contractor resists for that obvious reason. So when you are negotiating a finalised contract, just um, 
just bear that in mind. There is an argument to say that one requirement can be broken down into many little requirements. That's a tricky thing to do from a drafting perspective, but sometimes it's worth it. So for example, I'll give you an example of if you are engaging someone um, to do a wide range of tasks for you um, on your campus. The question you've got is, um, do we have one massive big contract that covers everything or do we have a lot of little contracts that cover all these bits and pieces? And they both have advantages and disadvantages. So the advantage of a massive contract enables there to be a lot more kind of efficiencies and cost savings and those sorts of things. But it's fiendishly difficult to put new things into that and to take things out of it and with certainty. And to, so if you've got seven or eight work streams going through a contract and you want to disengage with one, what is the knock-on effect then on the rest of the pricing and the service delivery and those sorts of things? Very difficult to draft. Whereas for certainty reasons, uh, as in so everybody knows where they are after such a disengagement, it might be better off to have seven or eight different contracts that stand and fall by their own endeavours. So that you can chop and change, add one, drop one, do all those sorts of things. But you'll, everybody will know where they are. But the trade-off for that is you're unlikely to achieve the overall efficiencies um, to the same extent. But sometimes it's worth it for the, for the sake of certainty. Okay, form of contract. Um, <coughs> the issue with form of contract is evidence. So when you have a contract, uh, you can enter it into it in any of those ways, but the problem with all of them, apart from uh, written and to a certain extent email, um, is evidence. So you can't actually prove what was agreed, what was signed up to. Um, you have just the same enforceability and contract issues, but for evidential reasons, obviously a written agreement is preferred over an email agreement, which is preferred over an online agreement, which is preferred over an oral agreement, and most definitely preferred over one by conduct. Um, because you have a descending scale of being able to prove who said what. And by the time you've got to oral agreements, if in the end of a dispute, you just might as well stand in a, in a courtroom and say, well, you said that, no, I didn't. You said that, no, I didn't. You said that, no, I didn't. I mean, that's a, it's very difficult for anybody to really know where they are. So beware the oral agreement. Some issues we might like to highlight. Um, Conditions precedent, you can have a contract that says this contract will only be binding in the event that X, Y and Z happens. Quite often we see that around things like planning consents or we see it around board <laughs> approval for various things. So we'll only, get into, we'll only have a contract in the event that um, the board approves it or things like that. And the same will apply to you if you have any restrictions on the size of contracts that you can do. You can still enter into a contract, but it will only become binding in the event that a senior officer signs it off. Um, so you can do that. There are evidence of funds or some sort of technical milestone. So when you prove to me your machine can do X, Y and Z, this contract will be binding on both of us and we will buy one. That sort of thing. Um, legal capacity. Um, unlikely to be feature much on your radar unless you are contracting with individuals. Sometimes you might be contracting with individual consultants um, and do they have the, the legal capacity to actually do what they say they're going to do? So that will mean are they, for example, um, uh, suffering from some sort of medical condition that prevents them from doing it or are they a minor, as in under the age of 18? Um, and just keep a very um, loose eye on that sort of thing. Um, illegality. Contracts cannot be enforceable if they are an agreement to do something illegal. So if you have a, a contract that contravenes environmental law or labour law or something like that, you won't be able to enforce it because it wasn't illegal in the first place. So contracts can't be used as a means of s forcing someone to do something illegal. So both parties have a, have a get out there. 
Um, is there a form that you have to enter into these contracts for? As I said earlier, some, some land transactions, sales of land and those sorts of things, still have to be done via deed. So um, you've got to be careful sometimes, Land Act stuff. Anything to do with land, think about there might be a special form for it. So if you're involved in any project that involves a land transaction, including a tenancy, then there might be a requirement for that to be in a very specific and proper form. Um, entered into by a person uh, lacking authority is also an issue, obviously, that you face. Um, the law on that hasn't changed for ages, and, and it won't come as any surprise to you when I say it's to do with how people hold themselves out. So if you have someone enter into purchase orders or purchase contracts, and it looks like they're the sort of person who should have authority to do that. So they have some sort of job title that enables the other side to believe that they have the authority to do this. The other side isn't under an obligation to check that. They're, they, they, they're, they're able to accept that. Um, somebody with the title of manager, director, head of, da, 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 has got authority to do that, clearly, on the flip side of that, they wouldn't be allowed to rely on something signed by the cleaner or um, office junior or anything like that, but as soon as you start getting up into the realms of manager or officer or something like that, then, then you've got to be pretty careful. Of course, people doing that is in a matter of employment law if they've then breached the um, employment contract and done something that they shouldn't have been doing. It doesn't help you, because you're still stuck with a contract with the other side, but it, it at least gives you someone to kick. Um, Pre-contractual representations. Um, as, as well as this list, of course, it had our tender responses. So usually, pre-contractual representations are not binding on anybody because within most contracts we will have an entire agreement clause which says nothing that isn't in, in, within the pages of this final agreement will be binding on either party. And we see um, quite a few occasions where that comes to the, um, the assistance of someone who's trying to get out of what they've said in a tender document, which is why, as I said earlier, quite a few people are now including in their list of documents that are incorporated into the contract the tender response. Um, but if you're doing that, make sure it's quite low down on the order of precedence so that your terms and conditions afterwards override what they've said in theirs. But if there's anything around the periphery of it that they've said they're going to do within the tender response, you've still got them contractually. And it's still incorporated into the, into the contract. So standard things like sales, literature and, and discussions and correspondence, uh, restrictions of liability, unless they are within the body of the contract, the contract has an entire agreement clause, you won't be able to rely on it, unless it is a misrepresentation. Um, if it's a misrepresentation, i.e. a bit of a fib, then you will be able, in certain circumstances, to void the contract completely. So there are three types of misrepresentation, innocent, negligent and fraudulent. And they're on a sliding scale of how naughty the fib was. So at the right at the sort of white lie end of the fib, it's an innocent misrepresentation. It doesn't really have a, doesn't strike to the heart of the contract. You're not entitled to terminate the contract in those situations. You have to do something to um, the contract to re uh, reflect that misrepresentation. Then you have in the, the biggest lump in the middle <laughs> is the negligent misrepresentation, where somebody said something um, or there was a representation made that wasn't, wasn't quite true, uh, but it, it then causes um, a bit of an issue later. And then in those circumstances, you have the option to terminate the contract if you want to. And at the extreme end, a fraudulent misrepresentation, as in a blatant black lie, you always terminate the contract in the event of a blatant black lie. Um, so documentation that we will usually see, again, I'd add to this list, non-disclosure agreements, things like that. Quite often, the, this is like the, the lawyer's nightmare of agreements, this. 
letters of intent, memorandum of understanding, heads of agreement. At what point is this stuff legally enforceable and what point isn't it legally enforceable? And it's also our nightmare because once every, somebody's got a letter of intent or an MOU in place, they tend to think, oh well, we'll sort out the contract one day and we'll carry on and we'll carry on and we'll carry on and we'll carry on. And so you end up with wholly unsuitable terms governing some quite complicated arrangements while you're just pretending that you're going through the motions of, of, of doing the final contract. And so my tips about things like letters of intent, MOUs, heads of agreement, that type of thing, I make them specific, limit them in duration and don't expose yourself to too much cost. So you'll say things like, the scope of this letter of engagement is this, it will expire on then and will be liable for a maximum of that. And so you have some certainty to it, and so you don't have something that just rolls on forever with you just footing the bill. Because horrifically, a lot of MOUs say things like, you will you will reimburse them their reasonable costs, or you'll pay them some, some god-awful daily rate, thinking that it's just a very short time scale at the beginning of a relationship, and it just drags on forever. And before you know you are, where you are, you're being litigated on for costs you had no idea you are incurring happens all the time. Supply of Goods and Services Act, Unfair Contract Terms Act, these are the things that will start to um, impose terms on you. They will put terms within the contract that you didn't otherwise um, explicitly agree. My examples I'm going to come on to shortly um, are around how to how to sort of mitigate the risk of this happening because, believe you me, you're better off having expressed terms and conditions in a contract than relying on implied terms nine times out of ten because you will at least know where you are if you're doing that. Um, so, uh, some of these apply to, I'll start with two that apply to both services and to goods. One is, we're all in a tendering environment, it's not on that list this one, Retendering clauses. For example, cheapy information. Cheapy information under the new cheapy regulations, you're only entitled to it 30 days before the proposed date of transfer. Utterly useless to you in a tender situation because you won't be able to go out to ITT with all the cheapy information in one place. Have clauses in there that say they will give you whatever information you want in relation to the provision of the services or the goods at any time you ask for it within X days. Don't leave it at that. They say you, you will give it to us because it will just drag it on forever. Say you'll give us whatever you want, whatever we want to know, you will tell us. And you'll tell it us within time and make the time something reasonable like about a week. Otherwise, you fail to get information out of incumbents because they won't want to give the competitors any sort of competitive advantage that, that they've got. So you have to be able to contractually beat them with a stick until you can actually um, get that information out of them. And the other thing is the penalty clause. Everybody likes a nice KPI, but what happens when they breach their KPIs? People still make the mistake of saying, in the event that you breach a KPI, we will deduct pounds from your payment. Oh, that's what people want to do. The message there is that penalty clauses are unenforceable in English law. Now, the difference between a penalty clause and what's called uh, an ascertained loss clause is that uh, when you get your work at your liquidated damages, which is the, the actual amount that you say you're going to deduct, it has to be based on fact. It can't just be a, a figure that's plucked out of the air intended to punish the other side. It has to be what it's cost you to put it right. So penalty clauses, big penalty clauses that say, if you do X, I will deduct a random amount of money that I can just, I've just thought of, are completely unenforceable. It has to have, as I say, this genuine loss element. So what's it cost you to rectify that problem? <coughs> people use that sort of clause as a negotiating tool to beat people up with. But if, if a supplier has been beaten up with it before, they will have taken legal advice and they will know it's unenforceable. So your bolt is then shot. So try to have... Um, KPI breach provisions that are linked, if they're financial, linked to the value of putting it right, 
but more likely have it linked to a suspension or a step in provision that says I'm going to give certain events a yellow card events and if you accumulate X number of yellow cards in Y amount of time I can either suspend the provision I can step into the provision and then step out again um, or I can terminate the contract at my discretion um, it's easier to do that than it is to um, actually deduct money from, 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 from incumbents. Um, so those are the two sort of general ones. Things in relation to services, obviously, specification, specification, specification. It's all about how, what is it you want and how you're going to measure it. Create the obligation to do it. Set the standard of service. Um, Beware diluting the strategy provision because this is one of the rare occasions where an implied term will be better than an express term. The other side will want you to say things like, we will do it to a reasonable standard or something like that. This, the statutory provision within the Sale of Goods, uh, Supply of Goods and Services Act is higher than that. It must be of satisfactory quality, not reasonable quality. So they will be able to vary that by introducing this idea of reasonable stuff. Um, time of performance, again, this is one where we swing the other way because the, the Act say time of performance will be reasonable. Well, that's no good to you. You want time of performance by our date. So be very specific about dates. Think about IP in certain situations around design or software or things like that. Uh, do you own it absolutely? Do you have an assignment to own all the IP to it? That has a commercial downside in that the other side, the supplier, will want a lot of money to do something that they can never use again. Or do you really only want a license to use it so that they can reuse it for other customers, which means that they might do it for, che for cheaper. But do you actually need, need the need to own the whole thing because it will be cheaper to just have a license to do it and think about in IT contracts as well if you're getting software developed a thing called an escrow agreement which is a separate agreement a bit like a bank vault so all the developed code sits in the escrow um, bodies vaults and it's released at certain events typically the insolvency of the provider because what you don't want in an IT contract scenario is to spend a lot of money having some software developed that you might not actually own because you've just made the choice to do it cheap and just take a license on it and then it just somebody they just go bust and disappear and then you can't use it again so think about an escrow agreement in those sorts of chain things obviously things like um, charges th uh, you know VAT important to a university for obvious reasons. Um, VAT sharing groups may be an option to you, see if there's a way to minimise your VAT liability. Um, then you've got payment. Beware of the no set off clause where it says you can't deduct amounts under we might dispute under this contract by paying us less under a different contract. So if you have multiple contracts with someone, it may be possible to actually pay them less under a different contract because they're performing badly under this contract. Um, try, and, try and stay with that. And don't overlook the boilerplates. You'd be surprised the, the pickles people get themselves in in relation to for litigation of the service of notices. If you have to sue someone, all those clauses at the end of the agreement that nobody ever likes to look at are all, all become vitally important. Um, all the stuff to do with the service of notice, deemed service, when you're going to be held to be, um, have actually uh, served a document on somebody else and how you're going to do it, all become remarkably important. <laughs> Force majeure is another good one. Um, running out of, down on the time a bit, um, but I just mentioned the difference on, on the sort of goods stuff. Um, think about having tolerances on the quantities you will accept, because qu quite often they can't deliver to you the exact amount that you want. Be specific about acceptance and rejection of goods, because the implied terms of the Sale of Goods Act is that you will have a reasonable time to inspect it, and that's a very movable feast. You can, if it's a, a particularly complicated piece of equipment, you get a lot longer to inspect it than something that's simple, but make sure that you do actually inspect it, because the clock will be ticking as soon as they actually deliver the thing, and if you're going to inspect it um, or not. Risk and title is different in goods, so that the, um, uh, the supplier will want a retention of title clause where you, you don't own it till you've paid for it. That's entirely 
usual and standard. And in summary, um, to talk about standard terms and conditions, the pros um, are that you have greater control over what's going out of your door in terms of contracting. If you have a standard set of terms and conditions, you don't have to obviously go through the rigmarole and pain of negotiating them each time. They're consistent and they are standardised. The cons of using uh, standard terms and conditions, you walk straight into the Unfair Contract Terms Act. The Unfair Contract Terms Act will apply when you are when you are um, contracting on standard terms and conditions or you are contracting with a consumer. So the Unfair Contract Terms Act, if you are individually negotiating terms on a, on a bespoke agreement basis, will not apply because the law says that you, you're, everybody's big and grown up enough to actually make their own agreements and bargains and so um, you, you do have more restrictions because of UCTA. And the, uh, the thing I would say about standard terms and conditions in this sector in particular is the relic set of terms and conditions. It's the stuff that everybody, somebody in some department has used since time began, uh, but it's bear no relation to what everybody else is using. They just happen to be sitting on their C drive and that's what they use because that's what they've always used. But they, they then become entirely unfit for purpose. Um, and that's an issue with standard terms and conditions. So in my summary of do's, clarity, make sure you try to include all the terms in one document um, specifically mention documents that you want to be binding. Um, always have consideration or use a deed. Um, remove uncertainty. Um, are there any conditions precedent or things you want to put in place that say this agreement will only be effective when X, Y and Z happens? Um, ensure that everybody's got the authority to do it. Um, and think about what pre-contractual representations like tender documents you may want to incorporate within the contract. Um, are, the con are the terms implied by statute better than the ones that the other side is proposing? Because quite often it, the other side will, will allow you to delete clauses um, even if you don't put your own in. Well, if, that's, if that then leaves you in a better position than accepting their clause, maybe you want to do it. Um, and make sure that you think about the wording that you use. And if you're going to do some free drafting, here's Martin's tip about free drafting, is don't, f everybody who does this who's, who's not legally qualified, or most people do, um, you put a clause in there and you'll start to use undefined terms, or you'll mean, you start, anything that begins with a capital letter is a defined term, which corresponds to something else that starts at the beginning of the contract. So beware the language that's used. If you're gonna use a defined term, make sure it's consistent throughout the document, and don't introduce new um, capitalized terms that don't have a definition at the start. Otherwise, you'll be uncertain as to what it means. There's your do's, here's your don'ts. Um, don't make offers, um, use invitations to negotiate. So don't give anybody, in a, especially in a tender situation, an opportunity to just take your contract um, as, it, as it stands, if that's not what you want. Do, don't accept um, a, an offer back from the other side. The tender, don't accept their tender, um, say that you are minded to award them the contract, but that that will be finalised between you. Um, <coughs> create obligations um, uh, uh, on yourself in pre-contractual documents more than is necessary. So don't say um, you'll be back. So be careful around the wording around site visits. And don't say, make sure they have plenty of disclaimers around, you have had the opportunity to come and view our site. Um, we make no representation, this is what it's gonna look like in the future. Um, you've, happened, you've seen it in one day, but you've, you've made your own inquiries and you are satisfied that what I'm telling you about this site is accurate and complete in all material respects. Things like that. Uh, don't sacrifice detail and agreement for the sake of getting it all in one place. So there's a great desire. Oh God, not another 20 page agreement. Well, some things need 50 page agreements. Some things need 150 page agreements. Um, make the effort because as I said right at the start, 95% of the time you won't need it, but in the 5% of the time where you do, by God, you really will need one. And you'll be grateful for the effort that you've put in. Um, and when you've been around sort of con contracts and contracting as long as I have, there's some horror stories, um, which I won't go into right now because I've run out of time. And that's the end of my 
session. Has anybody got any comments or questions or queries or anything? I'll be on our stand in the exhibition if anything occurs to you. Um, and if anybody wants to win a Kindle, come along. Thanks very much.